Hello everyone, it's Tim again, back for some more videos for Critical Reasoning. Um, I'm totally sick today, uh, so I apologize. I hope my voice doesn't sound too bad, but you're not um, going to be able to look at my uh, face. <laughs> I'm kind of a mess right now. Um, anyway, um, so yeah, I hope my voice is not too bad, and I'll try to keep the coughing to a minimum, etc. But this is the part four video lecture. Uh, for the formal evaluations of arguments uh, module, basically the formal logic crash course. And like I've been promising, I wanted to do some more uh, practice problems with you so you can just see how this all works a little bit more. Um, I've got this uh, document, Extra Truth Table Problems. It's up in the um, in Canvas. Um, <clears throat> and we'll just do some problems out of here and uh, get some more um, practice that way. So. Um, and we'll also be able to demonstrate the last element of truth table analysis, which is checking arguments for validity. So up until this point, we've mostly just been showing you how to do a truth table for a single claim. But what about when you have multiple claims here? Like here we've got not G and M, M or not G, therefore not G. What does it look like to do a truth table for a full argument that has, like in this case, three claims? Uh, and how can we use it to test for validity? You've seen me do this uh, in the introduction video, but now let's just do some more together and get some more practice, and um, hopefully you can feel more comfortable after this video doing all this. Um, my next video will be covering translations, which is the last thing that we haven't really talked about yet. How do you translate things from English into formal logic? And that has a bunch of challenges uh, on its own right, but we're going to put that off till the next video, so stay tuned for that later. <clears throat> One other little note here to, before we get started. This dot you see in this um, in this uh, picture from this uh, logic text I use in another class, um, it's using dots instead of ampersands. Um, and we'll use the ampersand again. Um, so let's actually, I'm, I'm just going to put this over to the side. <clears throat> and um, I'll copy it in here into our little whiteboard area. So we've got um, not G and M. Then we've got M <coughs> or not G. And then we've got not G. And this part is, um, we'll underline it to mark it as the conclusion. And then we'll put our little um, therefore symbol in there to make it look super pretty. And there we go. Okay, so this might be like something you'd see on the exam <clears throat> or on the homework. I might give you an argument and ask you to tell me whether this argument is valid or invalid using truth tables. So the first thing you have to do in setting up a truth table for an argument is do the same thing you have to do when setting up a truth table for a single claim. So we... Um, we look at all the different letters we've got in this argument. We've got G and M, so there's just two. So I'm going to set up my conditions, taking that into account. So, and I always like to kind of make a, um, oops, I always like to make a little double bar here to make it clear what is. Um, what are the conditions, and then what are the actual claims of the argument? But the first thing we got to do <clears throat> is set up all of our letters. So, ooh, not underlined anymore. There we go. G and M. There we are. And if we set up all of our possibilities, again, we're going to use this sort of um, two uh, to the nth power formula, where N stands for the number of different letters we've got. And we've got two here, so that's really two to the second power which is like 2 times 2, and that is 4. So I know I've got four different possibilities. I will cut that in half and make two of them true in the first column, and then two of them false. <clears throat> so four total possibilities, half and half. And then the next column, I'll cut that in half. So instead of going 2 by 2, I'll go 1 by 1. One true, one false. One true, one false. There we are. And let's make some more beautiful lines for our chart. And let's see, is it working? Come on. Don't you want to make a beautiful line for me? What's happening? 
Oh, there we go. There, I decided to do it. <clears throat> all right. Now, the next thing we got to do, this is step one, set up all your conditions. And again, we did that by looking at all the different letters that are in the argument here. Um, next thing we're going to do is make a different column here for every single claim that's in the argument, all the premises and the conclusions. So we've got um, not G and M. <clears throat> that's one claim. Um, and I like to mark up here, I, I like to remember that this is a premise. <clears throat> Just to keep, this will be important later, you'll see why I like to do this. Um, and then we've got M or not G. Ooh, there we go. M or, oh, well, I made that big. Didn't want to make that big. M or not G. That's also a premise. Ooh. And then finally we've got down here, uh, not G. <clears throat> and that's the conclusion okay and I'll make lines here for the columns awesome and then we guess we don't need all this extra space so let's get rid of that so we have some scratch paper area and then um, this is this is it for setup oh I also like to do this I like to separate the premises and the conclusion with a double line. Okay. You'll notice there's a little different setup than how the book does it. I've talked about that before in the video lecture that I teach a little different method. I think my method is a little um, easier and uh, creates less misconceptions than the way the book does it. Um, but if you did follow the book's method, it's not going to give you wrong answers. Uh, it's just, um, like I said, I think mine's a little bit better. So, <clears throat> at this point, it's basically like we have to do a, a bunch of different problems. We have like 12 calculations to make here. Every single one of these is a, a question mark. What is the truth value for the expression in this column under these possible conditions? And let's start with the easy one here, the not G. <clears throat> because if you remember, negation just always switches the truth value of whatever it's negating. Now sometimes the negation can attach to an entire parenthetical, like you see over here. Other times it's just a single letter. So in this case, um, we just have to look at what's going on with G and then flip it. So when G is true, then not G is false. And when G is false, then not G is true. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so that's one column figured out. Let's let's do these other ones now. So. I'm going to um, do some things. I'm not going to go through all of these in complete detail, but I do some things to try to help you out so you can do it the, like I said, there's kind of like, you can do things in your head a lot, but you want to do it the long way to start just to get good practice. So here <clears throat> with not G and M, I think the best thing to do is to start by thinking about the overall structure to the expression. So here we've got, you know, there's going to be, the line here that covers the entire expression. So we want to figure, and that's what we're really the most curious about. We want to really know what is this truth value down here? What is the truth value that attaches to the whole expression? But you remember, to calculate these things, we have to go parts to holes. So I'll start by knowing what's going on with G and M, um, but then I got to see how things get modified. So this is a whole chunk right here that then the negation is going to modify. So we have to figure out this first. I gotta know what's going on with G and M before I can figure out what's going on with not G and M. So <clears throat> the ampersand, let's go back to our little, uh, I've got this somewhere, where is it? Here, let me find this, I'll be right back. There we are, so <clears throat> you remember this chart here, this shows us the truth tables for uh, all the different operators, so and, is only true when both parts are true and that's where we I'm, I've been mentioning that there's some tricks to learn about the operators and it's it comes from having a very intimate understanding of the truth table and seeing how it functions um, so with and it's only true when they're both true so what this means is that if you know that one part of an amp of an a conjunction an and statement is false you don't even have to know what's going on with the other part you already know the whole thing is false so to go back over to our example here, um, if I know that, uh, let's say, you know, in these problems right here, if G is false, 
I don't even need to look at what's happening with M. I already know that this whole ampersand is actually false. Um, because it, it's only when they're both true that the conjunction will be true. So if the conjunction is false, then once you bring in the negation, that'll make it true. So I could automatically, um, so to speak, uh, put in <clears throat> true values in these two spots right here. And the reason, I mean, I didn't even have to look at the M. I just knew G was false. So that makes this conjunction false. And then the negation will flip that value to true. And remember again, the negation, very important. Negation modifies what immediately follows it. So if that's a parenthetical, i got to figure out the whole parenthetical, and then I can negate it. This negation is not to be distributed to the G and the M. To say, to deny not G and M is very different from saying something like this. Not G and not M. This is to say they're both false. This is just saying it's not the case that they're both true. Very different statements in logic. If we did a truth table for these two expressions, they'd come out completely differently. So, got to be careful about that. So the right way to handle negations is to just figure out what's going on inside the thing that's getting negated and then flip it. Okay, so that's how that works. But we could do it the long way too if we wanted. For example, I'll do, let's do that with the next two because we couldn't use the trick on them anyway. So um, let's delete this. <clears throat> so this is the long method. Let's calculate first for um, this situation here, the first box. It doesn't really matter the order that we do these. It's okay, but um, this is how we're going to do it. Um, so we're calculating for what's going on with not G and M when G and M are both true. When those, when those are the facts, G is true and M is true. Now what's going on with the whole thing? So <clears throat> first we've got to figure out what's happening with the AND statement. And when the two parts of an AND statement are true, then the whole thing is true. And that's what we've got here, right? When two parts are true, AND statement is true. Awesome possum. Now we know that, you know, ignore this for the time being. You know, just forget about that. Just G and M, that's true. So now if I'm thinking not something true, you know, go back to this, not something, when that something is true, then not something is false. Oops. Okay. So that means now that I know that this inside part is true, not that is going to be false. Boom. And that's the value that I'm going to stick over here. False. Okay. Now we've got one more to do. What happens when G is true and M is false? <clears throat> So this AND statement, not both parts are true. So that means it's going to be a false statement. And then, um, so I have to keep clicking around so much to do this on the computer. Now I can figure out what's going on with the negation. Because the, and, the conjunction is false, the negation of that conjunction is going to be a true statement. So we can replace this with true. All right, we're, we're almost done with this argument. We just have one more thing to do. we got to get through these. And I'm going to just erase them all now <clears throat> for convenience sake. And I'll teach you another trick. So this statement is all about uh, an or. It's a big or. It's M or not G. Remember to think about chunking. The negation only applies to the G. It's the or that's holding the whole thing together. So on our scratch paper, it's going to look a little different here. We've got M or not G. All right. Now, let's go back to our truth tables. With or, remember again, this is the inclusive disjunction, which is the default for or. Um, <clears throat> it's true as long as at least one of the two parts is true. And that means if at least, if both of them are true, well, then at least one of them is true. So that's still a true statement. It's only false when they're both false. So kind of like the trick we learned with uh, conjunction a second ago. If you if the P part or the Q part is true, then you know the whole thing is true. You don't have to look at the other side of it. So going back to this one, if M is true, well, then I know the whole thing is going to be true. The whole thing is going to be true no matter what, <clears throat> as long as M is true. 
So I could look at all the M true cases and just instantly put trues. Here's another M true right down here. Boom. True. These tricks are very, very useful, um, especially if you've got a very complicated thing. Like, I don't know, here I could make something really complicated. Let's say you have like P or, and then some like complicated mess here. I don't know, blah, blah, blah. That's not actual logic, what I just did here. But, you know, you can pretend. If there was <clears throat> just a bunch of whatever over here on this side, you would at least be able to cut your work in half. This is going to take a long time to calculate. And if P is false, then you would need to figure it out. But as long as P was true, then you'd know the whole thing would be true and you wouldn't have to calculate this business here. So that the tricks, the these are shortcuts that can be sometimes very useful. We got to make sure it's the right time for it. Um, <clears throat> and don't you can't use the tricks to cut out all of your work. Um, and that's why I always recommend doing it the long way for a while before you start trying to do the tricks. Okay, but now let's let's test. Uh, we got to figure out what's going on in this possibility. Here, G is true, M is false, so M false, and G true, and let's do it the long way here. So, looking at the structure of this, I know there's a not G chunk that's going to work off of what's happening with G, and then there's this or, um, which is going to be putting both sides together. So we got to figure that out. <clears throat> so again, negations just flip whatever they're negating. So if G is true, then not G is false. And now we've got a false or false case, and that is a false case for or. It's when both parts are false, that's when an or statement is false. Okay. So false goes in right there. Now we got one more case to figure out. And we can evaluate the whole argument. What happens when they're both false? So when M is false and G is false, what's going to happen? <clears throat> well, again, <clears throat> we got a negation here. It's going to mess with that chunk. And then we're going to figure out what's going on with the whole thing. And when G is false, then not G is true. And then a false or true statement, well, at least one of them is true. And that's what OR is saying. So we get a true statement here. Sorry about that R. I don't know where that came from. There we are. So true. All right. Now we're done. We have completed the truth table for the argument. Um, and there's one final step. We have to just say whether it's valid or invalid um, <clears throat> using the truth table. So remember, when we're asking about validity, we're wondering whether the argument is valid or not. Um, there's two things to, to the, what we're really asking is, is there a counterexample? to the argument's validity. <clears throat> and what's a counterexample? Counterexample for validity would be a case where you have all true premises and a false conclusion. That's our counterexample. Okay, so if um, yeah, let's move this one. So that's that's what we mean by a counterexample. So if there's two options, is there a counterexample? The answer could be yes, or the answer could be no. If the answer is yes, then the argument is invalid because we've proven that it's not valid by finding a counterexample. We could see like. The premise, the truth of premises, does not ensure the truth of the conclusion as long as it's possible to have all true premises and a false conclusion. But if we can't come up with a counterexample, and if the answer to that is no, then it's valid. So let's look here. We've got all the possibilities accounted for. Is there ever a case in which all the premises are true and the conclusion false at the same time? Is that ever happening? Well, let's look. No, I don't see it. So here in this first case, we have a false premise. We had another true premise and a false conclusion, but we have to get all of these to align this way. So this is why I think it's important to mark premises and conclusions here, so you can keep track of what you're looking for, for the counterexample. So no counterexample there. This one doesn't work out because you have another false premise. Here we have all true premises, but we don't have a false conclusion. Same thing here. So there is no counterexample, so that means the argument is valid. Yay! Sweet. 
So we just did one problem. That would be your final answer here. I give you this problem, tell you to, to tell me if it's valid or invalid using a truth table, and your answer would look like this. That would be your answer right here. Okay, let's, just, let's do some more. Let's do a, at least a couple more here before this video is done. All right, so I'm going to erase this and set up a new one. All right, I've set up a new one here, and I chose this one for a couple of reasons. One, it'll let us see truth tables for um, biconditionals and conditionals, which we haven't done yet in this uh, practice section, um, although I've shown you how they work in the last video, or last couple of videos. Um, but also because this one has three propositional letters, which is going to make things a little more complicated for us. Um, so this time, um, <clears throat> when I'm setting up all my possibilities, I have to think about all the combinations for what could be happening with A, B, and C, and that's going to take a little extra work um, than with these other ones that we were doing. So let's, um, there, there we go, here's some, and oops, uh, let's do another do another one right here. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay. Now with three different letters, so when we're dealing with A, oops, let's see, maybe I can get them all in here, B and C. Okay, so when we've got three propositional letters, now we're looking at that whole two, you know, to the nth power where n stands for the number of letters, now we're looking at 3. So that means we're looking at 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. So now we've got 8 possibilities to deal with. And we'll do the same thing we did with, with uh, only two letters with four possibilities. We'll make half of them true in the first column, half of them false. So if there's 8 possibilities, <clears throat> I'm looking at four trues, like that, and then four falses. And then the next column, I'm cutting that in half. So I'm going to make two trues, two falses, two trues, and two falses. And then the final column, I'm going to do the same thing except cut that in half from this column, which means instead of going two by two, we're going one by one. So we went four by four, two by two, now one by one. And if you follow this method, you will make sure that you've got all the possible combinations covered without having to like really be too anxious or paranoid about it or trying to play this kind of puzzle game to make sure you haven't forgotten anything. Um, so very convenient, <clears throat> highly recommend it. So I'm going to make some rows here now just for convenience. And there we go. I'm going to just wait for it to figure itself out. Okay, so now again, just like we did before, we got all of our possibilities figured out, but now we need to make a different column for all the different claims in the argument. So here, actually, I can do this a lot easier. Let's just do this. I'm going to copy and paste. So we've got this expression, A if and only if B or C. Then we've got this one, not C <clears throat> or B. So we'll put that in a separate column here. And then we've got the um, if A then B, um, which is the conclusion. And again, I like to, um, well, first of all, definitely make lines to separate what's going on with each of these, um, but also to make a double bar here for the conclusion, and then also to mark <clears throat> that these are premises and that this is the conclusion. Okay, and then just like before, we're going to be calculating our truth tables. <clears throat> um, 
doing it, uh, doing each calculation one at a time. And it might look like a lot of calculations here, and that's true. There are a lot of cal calculations to do here. Um, but some of them will be a little faster than others, and we can use some tricks to figure this stuff out. So, for example, this first one, A, then B, let's go taking a look at our truth table for the conditional. The conditional has only one false case. The case for the first part is true, and the second part is false. All the other cases are true. So we could use that uh, insight about the truth table to cut down on our work here. We know there's only going to be one type of false case, where A is true and B is false. So let's see if we can find those. A true, B false. Here they are. A true, B false. So I know that these two are the far false values. Boom and boom. And then those are the only ones where that combination is happening, so I can know all the rest are true. Great. That's nice and convenient. All right, and then we, we already talked about some tricks with the or last time. Remember, if there's just one thing by itself, as long as that thing's true, the whole thing is true. So whenever B is true, I'm going to know the whole thing is true. So those are B true cases here, and then there also B is true down here. So we can go true, true. Now these other cases, we'll actually have to calculate it. So let's get it out here just, just so we can uh, think about it. Man, I keep doing that. <clears throat> so all the, the uh, these remaining cases here are cases where B is false. <clears throat> so that means we have to see what's going on on the other side over here. Remember, with an OR statement, if at least one of them is true, then the whole thing is true. So if this part is true, here, let me get some lines in there so you can see what I mean. If this chunk right here, the not C chunk, is true, then this whole thing will be true. But what's that going to take? <laughs> well, in order for not C to be a true chunk, C will have to be false. So let's look for all the C false cases that we don't already have marked, and we'll know those are true cases. There and there. So we're only left with one type of case, where B is false and C is true. And when that's happening, when B is false and C is true, if this is true instead, then this will turn to be false, and then we'll have a false or false, and that will be actually false. <clears throat> actually, you know, I, here, I can, I can clean this up a little bit. Let's clean it up. Okay, so <clears throat> that might have been confusing. When C is true <clears throat> and B is false, then that makes this not C chunk false. And now we're looking at a false or false, and that's a false statement. Because the or statement is saying at least one of them is true, and hey, that's not happening, so it's false. So <clears throat> in those cases, we'll put false. All right, so now, now we've got this biconditional thing to deal with. And that's somewhat um, unfortunate in the sense that biconditionals don't have any easy tricks for working with them. Um, the biconditional pattern here with the truth table is that if P, the P and Q parts are both true or both false, if they have the same truth value, then the statement is true. But if they have different alternating truth values, then it's a false statement. So I can't just figure out what's happening with one part and figure out the whole thing. I need to figure out what's happening with both parts before I can make that evaluation. So let's take this one by one, shall we? The first case here, they're all true. So we've got true, true, and true. <clears throat> so we've got to figure out what's happening with the or chunk. At least one of those two parts is true, so it's a true statement. So now we're looking at true by conditional true. And because they're the same, same truth value, we'll get true. Awesome. Awesome possum. And actually, you know, we can kind of think about these. All of these first four cases are cases where A is true. So really, the whole game is about what's happening with the B or C chunk. We could probably do, just do some of this in our heads. So when B and C are true and false, respectively, then that will make B or C a true statement. And if A is true, then true, by conditional true, that'll be another true statement. Here, when B is false but C is true, you still get B or C being true. So true by conditional true, that's going to be true because they have the same value. 
And then here, when B and C are both false, well, that will make the OR statement false. So this chunk is now all false, but A is still true. So true by conditional false, and that's going to be a false value because they don't have the same truth value. So that's why we put false here. Now here, with these last four cases, A is false. So now when we're looking at with B and C, we're comparing that against A being false. Okay, so let's, uh, you know, this is, um, we're going over to our scratch paper. Now we're looking at a case where A is false. So that means it'll matter what's going on with this chunk in the, in the same way we were just talking about. But the only way this biconditional is going to be true now is if the B or C part is false, so that the two halves have the same truth value, false and false. So if B or C is true, then the whole biconditional will actually be false. So it's going to be, a, it'll look a little different here. So now when B and C are both true, when they're both true, then that will make the OR statement true. So now we've got false by conditional true. Those are different values, so that means it's false. And then <clears throat> here, when B is true and C is false, it's still going to be true because all the OR statement needs is at least one of them to be true. So we're going to have a false by conditional true case again, which is false because they don't have the same truth value for the biconditional. And same thing's happening here. At least one of them is true of B and C, so that's true. But A is still false, so false by conditional true, that's false. Now, when B and C are both false, well, that's what makes an OR statement false. When it, when it isn't the case, at least one of them is true. So now we've got a false by conditional false, and that's going to be true because by conditionals are true when their two parts have the same truth value. And in this case, that's happening. So we've got true. Awesome. Oh, somehow we forgot to do the last case here. Well, that's going to be a true case. Okay. Goof. Okay. Now we're looking for a counterexample. What do we got? Um, do we? Is this a counterexample? Nope. Because it's not a case where all the premises are true and the conclusion false all at the same time. That's what we're looking for. This doesn't fit the bill. True premises, but not a false conclusion. Same thing there, no counterexample there. We've got a false premise, so that's not there. And false premises here, so that's not gonna happen. Okay, both those aren't counterexamples. More false premises, okay, okay. And so no counterexamples, and then this one, true premises, but not a false conclusion, so no counterexamples. So hey, we looked throughout the whole thing, no counterexamples, so when there are no counterexamples, that makes the argument valid. So there we are. There's another one, solid. Okie dokes. Um, I think I'm going to call it there. This is kind of a short video, but um, I hope this gave you some good um, practice for how to do these problems and to see what, what your, your work is supposed to kind of look like. This scratch paper work, I always recommend doing it, but it's not a part of your answer. This is your answer. The truth tables for all the different claims in the argument, and then um, a statement about whether it's valid or invalid. That's what we're looking for. And that's all that we're going to be doing with symbolic logic, except for the translations, which I'll talk about in the next lecture. So until then, I'll see you then. Oh, wait, 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 wait. There's one more thing I want to talk about with you I haven't talked about yet. Um, I wanted to give you some tricks. You know, I've been talking about doing tricks with the uh, logical operators <clears throat> and there's one trick that I haven't talked about yet so let's talk about that right now so what about tricks with <clears throat> conditionals so conditionals are really interesting they've got this uh, asymmetrical aspect to them um, the only false case is when the first parts true and the second parts false but if it goes the other direction then it's actually true so this is really strange so let's keep in mind this case. It's only false when the first part's true and the second part's false. Okay, now let's make a note of that here. So only false when, <clears throat> and we had some special names for these, the antecedent is true and the consequent is false. Okay, that's the only false case for a um, conditional. So again, the antecedent is the part that comes first, and the consequent is the part that comes second. Um, here, I'll just draw this really quick. So that's the antecedent, 
and that is the consequent right there. Oh, I can make that arrow look better. Yep. Boom. Drawing with the mouse, terrible. Okay, so antecedent consequent. So the only time it's false is when the first part is true and the second part is false, antecedent true, consequent false. Then there's a couple things that we can remember as tricks when we're talking about conditionals and truth tables. If the antecedent, oh, I can't spell. If the antecedent is false, then the conditional is, I'm just going to put it as auto true. Okay? Because if the antecedent is false, then we can't get this combo of true antecedent false consequent. Similarly, if the consequent is true, then the conditional is auto true. Again, okay, because it, for the sim similar reason. I mean, the, the patterns here are different, but the, the rationale is the same. Um, if the consequent is true instead of false, then we can't get this counterexample case, which will make the conditional false. Okay, so these are really useful in dealing with certain types of conditionals. Um, again, let's uh, let me demonstrate for you. Um, let's get a couple more conditionals. I have to copy these because they aren't easy to access from the keyboard. But <clears throat> when are you going to want to remember this trick? Again, you don't need to use the tricks at all. I mean, you can calculate everything the long way using the uh, truth tables that, that you need to memorize. Um, the, the, these truth tables right here, you need to memorize those. And you can crunch them all out using the long method, um, taking everything step by step. It parts the holes like I've been talking about. That's fine. But the tricks can sometimes save you some time. Um, the easiest time to use this trick is when you've got some simple antecedent and then some like really complicated something. Again, uh, this isn't logical symbols, but I'm just making a mess here for, um, for the sake of saying there's something complicated on the other end of this conditional, okay? If that's happening, um, then you'll just look down the truth tables for all the cases in which P is false, and you'll know the whole thing is true, and you just cut your work in half. The other half, you'll still have to calculate what's going on with A, K, L, G, N, A, whatever it is. Um, you'll still have to do the hard work of dealing with that, <clears throat> but you've saved yourself some time. Um, likewise, if you've got some big um, complicated thing going on, at the beginning of a conditional and then it ends with a single propositional letter like just P then this is the one that you'll want to use then this trick will save you some time because now you'll look for when P is true and those will be all true cases for this big conditional um, chances are this should probably have you know parent it'll have parentheses you know to because um, you can't have a bunch of letters next to it so I mean, I guess it's silly because I'm just being a goof with all the just pounding on my keyboard. But so this doesn't, that's not an actual logical statement. But um, <clears throat> it would have parentheses there. So when it's a really complicated thing on the antecedent side, but a very simple consequent, then this trick will be the easiest one to use. Okay, that's all the tricks. Um, I'm pretty sure no other tricks. Negation is just a light switch. It's easy to remember. Biconditional, same. It's true. Different. It's false. We just talked about the tricks here. Conditionals with or are cases where if at least one of them is true, then the whole thing is true. You don't even have to look at the other one. And uh, with and, if at least one of them is false, then you know the whole thing is false without having to look at the other one. So those are all the tricks, uh, shortcuts, tips and tricks I got for you. Okay, that's it. Goodbye for reals this time, and I'll see you in the next lecture.